yeah, a bit of a change in pace, I guess, in um, this presentation. So um, what we're going to be going through here is um, going to take you through global growth and inflation outlook. Um, pretty much, um, you know, what that means for the central banks, um, where what they say versus uh, what the most likely path is. And um, a bit on risk and opportunities, how that translates into, um, you know, asset allocation views. And I guess just a little bit of context. Um, um, okay, had a pretty good introduction there, but um, just in terms of how I see the world, I guess. Uh, so Top Down Charts, yes, is an independent research firm. Clients are, you know, hedge funds, pension companies, etc. And um, the reason for being is to add analytical muscle to, to what they're doing. And, and so that means that, um, you know, we, we do have some shorter term uh, trading views from time to time, but, you know, I guess that the tone of this presentation kind of reflects um, the focus that we have, which is kind of more of a medium term time frame, sort of strategic uh, sort of input there. And, and in terms of what uh, kind of indicators and what, what input we're actually looking at, it's, um, you know, top down macro, data driven, chart focused. Uh, comfortable looking at the technicals as well as the fundamentals is pretty much um, a multi-factor approach. Anything that um, adds to to um, to the view, and, and so we'll start here with the global growth and inflation outlook. So these two charts here are, are pretty key to my mind. So we've got here the property price growth for the major economies, and the reason why I like to look at property prices as, you know, almost the first thing I look at when it comes to understanding the, the economic outlook is because they just have such a huge bearing on both the growth and the risk outlook. So, you know, if you think about um, back to that 2007, 2008 period, the financial crisis, um, you know, property prices had started to roll over in the US before that hap that all kicked off. And, you know, if you'd been focusing on that, then um, you, you, you probably would have uh, started to step aside uh, before things really got ugly. And and by the same same tune, um, you know, when when we had those dual corrections, 2015, 2016, and uh, we see, we're sort seeing pretty good strength across across these major economies on property prices, uh, it was one thing that helped raise the conviction to get back into the markets then. The other one there is uh, global trade. So I think that's another really key one. And, you know, you might have heard about this idea of the synchronized global economic upturn. And uh, this global trade is really a key sort of transmission mechanism for that. If global trade's doing well, then, you know, all the sort of emerging markets, export oriented economies tend to do well. And, you know, obviously what's, what, what drives better global trade is, is typically better demand in uh, the major consumer economies. And we'll touch on that in a second. But just in terms of how this is playing out, it's, it's, um, we had a pretty good rebound out of that kind of uh, almost a global trade recession in 2015. We sort of had a near miss recession then. And now we've got the leading indicator there in the red line um, pointing to pretty solid uh, year for global trade. Um, and you know, that stands in contrast, I guess, to some of the rhetoric or the news or the noise, you might call it, around protectionism and how that was going to, you know, um, put a dampener on that, but turned out to be the opposite. That's, again, why I try to um, focus you know, as much as possible on the charts, on the data, you know, let the indicators do the speaking rather than um, the, the news or the noise, as I often call it. And so, yeah, in terms of the demand side of things, you know, developed economies have been a pretty key driver of export, you know, global trade demand. And you can see here, this is the chart on the left shows you a sort of a composite view across the various economic confidence, sentiment, activity indicators for these economies. And and it's shown as a Z-score there just to standardize them, put them on sort of common terms. And you can see there, whether it's USA, Eurozone, Japan, they've all seen this really significant upturn here. So it's not just um, a case of, you know, some sort of um, American-centered, um, you know, we're excited about Trump. It's, it's actually pretty widespread. And um, the reason why that one's so important is when you start to factor in the, its uh, sort of companion chart there to the right, which shows you a view of 
industrial capacity utilisation and labour market um, utilisation, which is the unemployment rate in this situation. And um, this is across, so GDP weighted across developed economies. And you can see that it's just, um, just that gap's really closed up. And, you know, this it, we've sort of been dealing with this kind of mystery of where where has inflation gone? You know, why hasn't inflation returned? And, you know, when you're dealing with such a prolonged and deep period of spare capacity that we've been through there, you know, it actually takes quite a long time for that to be sort of, um, to go through the system. And and so, you know, in that sense, it's actually not that unsurprising that, um, you know, that we haven't had inflation come through yet. Going forward though, um, you know, when you have stronger stronger demand and tighter capacity, then you know that's a recipe for inflation. And going into America, so the view for US there, that's um, the chart on the left shows you the unemployment rate, and that's um, you know some people say, well, you know the unemployment rate's not a perfect indicator; it doesn't give you the a proper view. But then what I've got here is. So the, the grey line is from the Consumer Confidence Survey. That's uh, basically their response to a question which says, you know, how hard, how easy is it to find a job? And they're saying that it's basically pretty easy to find a job at the moment. Um, you know, it's just as easy as it was um, around that that to the, the late 90s period. And for small business, that that line there is um, basically how how hard is it for a small business to to find an employee? And it's um, that's actually, it's shown so that it's um, consistent with that, but it's basically really difficult for them. They're having difficulty finding finding um, the, the labour that they need. So basically, you know, whether it's the unemployment rate or a sort of independent verification, the signal is that um, the labour market's pretty tight. And that's consistent with what we've seen out of the Fed, which we'll talk about more in a minute. But it also speaks to, I guess, the maturity of the business cycle and you know, we are getting towards the, the later end of um, the business cycle there. I'll show you their view of the yield curve. The yield curve provides another view on, um, you know, how we're tracking through the, the cycle. Um, in that respect, you know, not not yet worried in terms of, you know, are we at the top? Uh, the yield curve hasn't fully inverted yet. So, you know, that's one thing that hasn't sort of, one box that hasn't been ticked. But it's certainly, um, you know, getting towards a more challenging um, part of the cycle for for asset allocation, and that'll become pretty clear, I guess, um, as we go across the next few slides. So, just the key conclusions there from the the global glo global growth inflation outlook. So, global growth, um, there's a number of factors. So, we showed you rising property prices, global trade, but um, you know, didn't show the Manufacturing confidence is running at a really good pace. Uh, corporate earnings have been corporate earnings growth across the world has actually been pretty solid, and consumer confidence is pretty strong across the globe as well. So, you know, all that's kind of supporting that synchronised upturn, and particularly in developed economies. And so, you know, the other theme is there is the maturing cycle, and when the as the cycle matures, you tend to get more inflation, and that's kind of consistent with. Um, the charts that I've showed you there. And this is, um, you know, as we're getting to, towards where the rubber hits the road in terms of markets, this, this, is, this is step one. So what do we expect from the central banks? Uh, this one here on the left shows you a view of um, the, the pace of expansion of global central bank balance sheets. And, you know, the, the line that I put up there um, there says, you know, 2017 marked a turning point for global central bank balance sheet expansion. And you can see that there in the chart, um, you know, probably one that um, might be surprising to some is the um, the Bank of Japan there. You know, they, they switch their target from saying, you know, we're going to buy a certain amount every year to we're going to try and keep the 10-year the bond yield, the government, Japanese government bond yield, around 0%. And it seems like the line in the sand is um, 10 basis points on that, on the on the Japanese 10-year government bond yield. And, you know, that's going to be, um, it's sort of as a side note, that's going to be a very interesting, um, you know, thing to watch because, 
you know, they're, they're, they're effectively fighting against the tide at this point because you're seeing a global trend for higher bond yields and, you know, effectively they undertook a stealth taper there. You can see that they actually ended up lowering their pace of purchases, but it's kind of weird, kind of perverse in a way that they want to target um, the bond yield at a, at a fixed level because, you know, it's like, typically the things that make bond yields go up is a, is a stronger economy. And so if you have uh, better growth and inflation outlook, then, you know, by definition, if they wanted to hold the bond yield down, then they'd have to keep on buying bonds. And, um, you know, kind of that, that would mean that they'd end up easing more um, as the economy got stronger. So I would say that we're probably going to, well, all that leads to is basically that we're probably going to see some change in tone, change in messaging, change in targets from the Bank of Japan at some point. They managed to get that stealth taper in without upsetting markets, but, you know, the next time that they, um, you know, move outright on that to be a bit more explicit, then, you know, you can probably expect a bit more indigestion next time. The other thing, the ECB, they've made no secret about their plans to phase out um, quantitative easing later this year, but these these two are still going. And meanwhile, the Fed has um, gone full circle. They've started tightening there. You can see on the, the chart on the right, that kind of gives you a feel for how much tightening they've done so far, but, you know, it's still very small steps. You know, since um, they began tapering in October, they announced it in October, so they've kicked it off in November. Um, they've had a 35 billion dollar rundown um, in the treasury holdings and that, you know, to put that into context, back when um, QE3 was in its heyday, they were running at a pace of um, 85 billion a month um, of purchases. So, you know, it's, it's still very much baby steps, but, you know, the, the direction there is for, um, you know, the, the, the tides are turning is the, the key message on that one. And, and it's not just on balance sheet, it's also on policy rates. So chart on the left there shows you the in the light blue line the developed markets composite policy rate you can see that it's already seen um, you know 46 basis points of tightening in the aggregate across um, the, the developed economies but also um, the sort of lesser known indicator to the lower of it so that that sort of gray black line that's the composite shadow rate so so the shadow rate is put together um, by a researcher at the Reserve Bank of New Zealand of all places and um, basically the shadow rate is designed to give you what the policy rate would look like when you take into account the um, pace of quantitative easing. And um, and you can see there that, you know, when um, when we, um, when, you know, the biggest, when, when QE3 was sort of going on um, around 2013, the, the composite shadow rate was, you know, well below where um, the headline policy rate was. And um, the other thing there too is looking at this, how this one behaved around that 2015-16 period. Um, you know, we had a number of central banks actually kick up, step up what they're doing there. And that was um, pretty key going into those 2015-2016 um, corrections. So, you know, the, adding in that monetary policy picture along with that global trade picture that I that I showed you earlier, um, they just would have only added to conviction and that's why, you know, at that time it was very, very bullish on the outlook and and you know, with the benefit of hindsight that um there was those forces that helped uh, reinforce and um, spur on the new bull market that we saw. But um but it's not also it's um it's also interesting to note their uh, you know, while we've had quite a bit of tightening, you know, or normalisation, they like to call it, um, in developed economies, uh, emerging markets have actually been fairly steadily easing. So, so 2017 um, sort of saw a turning point um, for developed economies, but for emerging markets, they pretty much were embarking on another round of, of monetary policy easing, quite a lot of rate cuts there, as you can see in the chart. And um, and you can see there that it has a pretty pretty clear impact on uh, the, the the cycle the economic cycle indicator. But I would say that they're probably um, <clears throat> probably near the bot near the end of their their easing cycle now, and um, and they're just going to be um, you know adding to that that idea that 
you know, globally, monetary policy is at a turning point, and we're we're transitioning from the period of easing, where um, you know, where that's very supportive for equity markets for risk assets um, in the early stages of of, of the market cycle. The other one there is that the, is um, China in particular. So you can see there how China in 2015 made this big, um, very big and decisive shift, uh, both on fiscal and monetary policy. And so the blue line is the monetary conditions, monetary policy indicator. The black line is the um, is the fiscal indicator. And, and in 2015, they were going through. They probably came as close to a recession as it gets for China. I mean, China kind of never goes into a recession. They always end up, um, you know, stimulating their way out of it. You know, that's the that's I guess one benefit of um, you know having only one party and having a bit of a um, more autocratic rule or a bit more one-minded rule is that um, you know if you need to get something done, then you just do it. <laughs> there's no um, there's no debate about it. Um, well, there's probably debate going on in the halls um, of the People's uh, Congress, but um, you know, there's big decisive easing there, and that was another key driver of the, the rebound uh, across not just um, equities but also commodities. Uh, you know, when I saw that one starting to turn around, I was pretty clear that you know, commodities um, are going to be a one-way bet at that point. And now that that one's actually turned, it's it hasn't gone full circle in that you know they they haven't they've sort of paused around neutral at the moment. Um, it's it's certainly at least less of a tailwind, and I guess that's the probably the key point of all of this is that you know monetary policy was a big tailwind for risk assets, big tailwind for the economy global economy and now um, you know going forward that's increasingly going to be less um, of the case so just to summarize there quantitative easing the tides are the tides have turned really already uh, developed economies along with the journey from quantitative easing to quantitative tightening traditional policies are starting to turn too and for emerging markets um, after that renewed easing wave they're about to turn the, the corner on policy as well so how does this tie into markets? The all important question. It's all very well to to talk about the the economic outlook and muse about the one hand and the on the other hand, but how does it actually relate to markets? So I guess the first stop here is um, bond yields. So you know, there's a pretty close tie with um, with US ten year bond yields and the longer term US GDP. Um, growth rate there, and I've actually used IMF forecast for this one. Um, and you know, with the tax cuts, that's probably just going to be even more accentuated. That you know, we've seen a a bottom in the longer term US GDP growth rate, and that's key because you know, if you wanted to actually see or you know take a view that um, the bond yields have um, bottomed, then you know, you need to Kind of look beyond the technicals sometimes and make sure that the the fundamental case is actually supporting that. And in this case, it is. I mean, of course, bonds don't move in a straight line, and um, you know some of the things that have been driving that latest surge there. Um, you know, bonds are still pretty undervalued. I mean, overvalued on our um, metrics, and you know that economic cycle pitches looking very positive short term as well on sentiment we've had a big turnaround there um i might show you another chart at the end on that um when we look at the website but basically um you know we're moving it's it's going to be choppy and i think that we're probably going to see a slight pullback um in yields um in the short term but medium term view is to, to expect um higher bond yields and Similar kind of um, sentiment here, but slightly different um, indicators. So we're looking at the, the gold price on the chart to the right. Uh, you know, quantitative easing was definitely a tailwind for gold and um, for a lot of commodities, actually. But now that we've turned the corner of that, um, 
you know, you can see there that that, that shadow fund rate, shadow fed funds rate that I talked about before, you know, now that that's starting to increase, it's shown there inverted, that's going to um, present a headwind for gold. And, you know, when a certain asset or financial market, you know, comes up against headwinds, it doesn't mean that they can't necessarily overcome those headwinds and certainly, you know, short term, it can chop around a lot, but I, um, I place a fairly decent weight on this one, along with a few other indicators that we're watching and, um, you know, have a medium term bearish bias for gold. Um, at the moment, if you look at the technicals as well, so, you know, as much as I like to talk about the fundamentals, you know, sometimes you do have to just listen to price and, um, you know, if, if price is telling you um, something, sometimes that can speak louder than the fundamentals and, and of course, price can price moves faster than fundamentals as well. So, you know, that 1350, 1400 level for gold, if it pops above that, you know, it's probably just going to keep on going. Um, and I guess that's another point for, for this chart is that, you know, when we do get the next um, next recession or crisis, we'll probably see more quantitative easing and, you know, that'll, you know, again, become a tailwind. But for now, and and of course, you know, if it comes up against these um, levels 1400, 1350, doesn't, doesn't manage to get above and fails to, um, you know, fails on that pretty key resistance level, then that only adds to the case. And um, moving on to global equities, so we're looking at this um, equities at a, a sort of a global level. Um, pretty interesting stage of the cycle again, as I mentioned before, because, you know, equities tend to, if you think about the, you know, asset allocation clock, you know, and thinking about the business cycle, equities tend to do the best uh, coming out of a recession, you know, into the recovery. And then after that, commodities tend to take over and then going into um, into a downturn, bonds tend to do well and, um, you know, sort of goes for that, that cycle. At this point, you know, I think, you know, equities have still got um, some time, to, some room to run here, you know, just like I said before with the economic cycle, I'm not seeing any signs that the economic cycle's over yet and um, same thing for equities, but it's we're certainly at um, a different stage of the bull market now. And so if you look at the chart on the left here, um, you've got basically what that's showing you is in the red line, the, the lighter red line is um, countries where their forward PE ratio is a little bit more expensive than usual. And for the darker red line, it's countries where they're, um, you know, significantly more expensive than usual. And, um, you know, if that level's at 100, that means that every market in the world is more expensive than usual. And you can see there, um, you know, the height of the dot-com mania, that was when that indicator became, you know, very extreme. Um, and at the moment, we're getting up there, certainly getting up there. Uh, you know, history shows that we, you know, in the late, in the early 90s and the late 90s that you can get, um, that you can go further on this one. But, you know, we are at, actually at levels where we were, where we got to um, in 2006, 2007, 2008, you know, around the market peak there and even around that shorter term market peak in, um, in 2014, 2015. And, you know, the chart on the right there actually showed that one earlier this year in another presentation. Um, <laughs> it was before that we got that spike there. So you might argue that we can actually probably remove that um, question mark on for this chart now. Global equity volatility has bottomed. And uh, you expect to see greater volatility as the business cycle matures and certainly as monetary policy support becomes less and less and moves from a tailwind to a headwind. Um, we move into a more volatile uh, regime. And that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, um, volatility goes up, markets go down. Um, usually it's the other way around when you get that kind of situation and, you know, volatility becomes a contrarian indicator. But it's more of a um, moving out of this low volatility environment into a um, a high volatility environment where 
the where we're still in a bull market and you know that's entirely consistent with um, what the central banks have been doing part of what monetary policy does is um, dampen down you know certainly when they're easing is dampen down volatility and so you know they've, they've, they've done their job there now last two charts probably the key ones really um, or probably I think the most interesting pair of charts that you could look at and um, at you know this time of the cycle on the the left hand there you've got the um, so you've got the valuation indicators for treasuries s p 500 and property and um, we're in this unique situation here you're unique in the period of history that we're covering where all three of these assets are fairly expensive so you know we went for this period where um, you know dot-com boom it was just equities that were really expensive um, prior to the financial crisis it was property that was really expensive and now um, you know it's it's all three of them so what do you do when um, all three of the major assets are overvalued and then you and then you look at the chart on the left on the right there and it also shows you um, I guess that well key driver of that I suppose is that um, you know as we've been for that zero interest rate environment um, cash allocations have dropped to um, very low levels very low levels so that shows you the implied allocation to cash from ICI so mutual fund data and then the AAII survey so surveyed and actual data um, whatever way you look at it cash allocations are, are at the low end and you know um, sort of put that interesting line there you know what a contrarian would do in the face of these two charts um, and I might leave it at that for that one and um, just finish off with um, a bit of a summary of um, of the risks and opportunities across those major asset classes so fixed income commodities bond yields are biased to go higher over the medium term uh, gold is at risk from quantitative tightening global equities a higher valuations changing volatility regime maturing cycle equals harder times ahead and so that means you know when you get to this point in the cycle the focus on risk management having a process um, a set of indicators having a plan of how you're going to manage um, the equity exposure as we you know get to the end of the cycle because you know if you think about you know planning for a bear market for example there's there's two ways that you can approach that you can either be preemptive and say you know valuations are high monetary policy is tightening all the rest of it and say I'm just going to step out and stand on the sidelines um, the risk of doing that is that the market then goes up another 30 40 percent um, or you can be reactive and you can say you know I'm going to wait until I see um, you know 200 um, breakdown for the 200 moving average um, uh, you know wait for economic indicators to roll over we're going to wait for um, until I get all those signals and then I'm going to um, jump out so you know neither one is necessarily right because if you if your plan is to be reactive to get out after the bull the bear market has started um, you know, situations like 1987 just um, show you that you know you 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 can um, the market can move very quickly um, if it wants to and you can get um, left thinking about why your plan didn't work and so you know I guess um, a mix a blended approach or a bit of each is um, you know how I would run it and um, certainly at this point um, looking at more more neutral um, absolute um, equity um, allocations um, still overweight for emerging markets because I think you know the other point there is focusing on relative value um, you know the US markets very expensive but there's still um, pockets of uh, cheaper markets out in the global um, universe there and then um, on the, the cash aspect so that is kind of what I was um, talk, just talking about you know the, the growth versus defensive mix um, the major asset classes all look richly priced um, cash just about always does its job in preserving capital and that's a pretty key line there too because you know as bonds are still overvalued looks like we're seeing the bottom in bonds 
yields um it's not necessarily given that uh you know that if you switch from equities to bonds that you know that's actually going to protect you you know we we've, we've seen a bit of a preview of that this year um where bond yields can go up and sort of catalyze a, a move down in in equities so you know i guess that comes back to thinking about what you know and understanding what you're investing in um and making sure that you know it is going to be um doing what you want it to or performing um as you you know in line with um your expectations um and understanding so i might just leave it there that's a disclaimer i probably should have showed that at the start um where to find us um on the blog so topdowncharts.com or you can just google top down charts and you'll find us um, pretty active on twitter and linkedin um, in terms of what we offer um, you can have a look on the website there and check out um, a trial if you're interested um, it's basically um, weekly research pieces and uh, monthly chart book um, and i think i'll just uh, I don't know if we have any questions, but if we do have any questions, uh, now is the time. Right, well, I did have a couple of questions um, that, that people asked me offline. So, um, first one was, will China make a policy mistake? And um, I guess we can go back to that chart there on the right. So uh, I guess the the, the sort of um, the concern there is that they move to tightening mode. And you know, um, if you've seen some of the headlines on China, they've they've been saying that they want to crack down on excessive leverage. Um, you know, and you know, one way that you do that is that you tighten policy. But you know, I would say that there is a risk, you know, there's definitely a risk of a policy mistake there that they tighten too fast. But, you know, if you look at that chart there, it shows that they swing from one way to another very quickly and decisively. So, and one, one key indicator, if you want to look at to understand China's um, policy settings or policy direction is just, um, just to look at, you know, property prices in China. In 2015, when property prices were, were slowing down notably, um, they they stepped they stepped up easing, like monetary easing. They pulled back restrictions on property purchases and um, that engineered a pretty swift rebound. Um, and likewise, you know, in the previous episodes when they'd been tight um, when when things had been going too too high to the to the upside, they'd been tightening pretty rapidly. So, you know, I would say Yes, there's definitely a risk that China makes a policy mistake, but then <clears throat> because they're they're pretty, you know, they're sort of they're, sometimes you term that kind of government technocratic. Um, they're very, you know, the moment that they push things too far, they probably, you know, immediately react and um, um, you know switch into easing mode again. So, you know, um, if you were just sitting there. Um, as a passive investor, um, that's probably a risk for you. But you know, if you're an active investor, um, <clears throat> that that kind of scenario would create all sorts of opportunities. Um, any other questions there? I guess one more that I had was. Um, Will we see quantitative easing four or QE four? And um, you know, you look at the the chart on balance sheet expansion there, and um, you know, you think about how widely uh, quantitative easing has been adopted by central banks. You know, um, I've just shown the big ones here, but there's also the Bank of England, Swiss National Bank, um, and some of the Scandinavian ones. Um, that have engaged in quantitative easing. And, you know, back around, you know, when the crisis kicked off and, you know, QE1 was implemented, um, quantitative easing was a unconventional, extraordinary monetary policy tool, but now it's basically just uh, part of the toolkit. 
So I would say that, you know, because it's now a fairly standard tool in monetary policy, you know, the next time that we get a recession or a financial crisis, um, we'll, we'll almost certainly get another round of quantitative easing. Um, and of course, it, it, it doesn't depend in part where we get to um, with policy rates. So if, if the Fed funds rate uh, rises to say four or five percent in this cycle, it might end up being enough to um, only cut rates. But now they've got quantitative easing as part of their targets. And the other question I had here was, um, have bond yields peaked? So um, that chart of bond yields there um, versus GDP growth, um, I kind of was pretty, you know, um, over the medium term, I think that they have bottomed. Um, but in the short term, there's probably a risk that they do see a pullback. So I'll just take you to the website just to give you a little bit of a look there. So. Um, this is an article just popped up uh, this morning, and you can see there this is um, a sentiment indicator, a composite sentiment indicator for treasuries, and you can see that it's switched. Um, you know, before that latest move began, it was in extreme um, bullish mode, so pretty much the consensus was that yields are going to go lower, and whenever you get to a consensus in markets, usually that's time to trade it, uh, to fade it rather, and um, now we're, we're in the process of switching to the other side. Um, you can see there in, in late 2017, um, early 2017, at the end of that sort of Trump tantrum move in bond yields, uh, we'd moved over into extreme bearish, um, so that you know the consensus was expecting higher yields, and um, again that was the time to fade. It wasn't as big a move there, but you know as this indicator moves up, um, I would say that you know there is a risk that we see perhaps a short-term pullback in yields or i.e. a rebound in bond prices um, or a little bit of sideways movement before um, the next upward uh, move uh, resumes. And yes, yeah, so on the website there, just uh, my final comments. Um, so if you want to learn more about what we're doing, you can click on the subscribe button. Uh, we've got the follow buttons there. We've also got some YouTube videos. Um, but otherwise, uh, if you click on there, it'll bring you to the home page and we've got a um, series of uh, interesting articles, a little bit more there on global trade. Um, and I will leave it at that. And uh, yeah, if you want to learn more, just get in touch.